My first talk is going to be an overview of the Personal Space Weather Station project. So in addition to the Auroral Connection, HAMSI is also funded to develop something called the Personal Space Weather Station. And we're funded to do this through the National Science Foundation. So this HAMSI workshop um, serves a dual purpose. One is to have this auroral connection uh, theme and uh, talk about ham radio science in general. And the second part is to serve as a team meeting for the personal space weather station uh, team, the people working on this particular project. So I'm going to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is just give an explanation and overview of what this project is and a general project update. And then after my talk, for the rest of the morning, we'll be hearing talks from other team members uh, about specific parts of the project. So we've already mentioned that ham radio operators are able to communicate long distances and their signals can be affected by the ionosphere and by space. So how exactly does that work? So over here on the left, these are frequencies that ham radio operators often use. Uh, I especially have a particular interest in these HF frequencies between three and a half and 30 megahertz. Other people have more of an interest in maybe medium frequency and low frequency bands. Other people might have an interest in high frequency bands, but they're all affected by the ionosphere and the atmosphere and other effects in different ways. So if we look at the HF band, ham radio operators routinely use HF and VHF transionospheric links. What does that mean? Well. Uh, the ionosphere is a layer of the upper atmosphere where you have electrically charged particles uh, moving in, in what's called a plasma. And you can have gradients in the plasma density in the ionosphere with a peak somewhere between 200 to 300 kilometers altitude above the Earth's surface. That's what we call the F region ionosphere. Ham radio operators will often use roughly 100 watts into a dipole antenna. This is a fairly modest station. And you can see we have a number of different modes. We can use digital modes like FT is very popular these days. You can use uh, Morse code or CW. We also have a single sideband phone. Uh, if you have a transmitter located in one place and a receiver located in another place, uh, you can do, you can have um, what we call, this is a ray trace diagram using 14 megahertz. You can have that signal go up, be bent, uh, or refracted by the ionosphere and then come back, back down and reach that signal. Anything that happens in the ionosphere will modulate or cause an effect on this signal that we can see over here. Uh, also, you have to have the frequency that in op the frequency that you're using be just right in order to get this sort of refraction. If you go too high in frequency, you'll escape into space. If you go too low in frequency, you could be absorbed by the ionosphere for a particular uh, ionosphere. So there's a lot of things, but the basic idea is you get this refraction of the signal. Um, how is the ionosphere created? The, to, a, to the most basic level, the ionosphere is generated by uh, X-ray and ultraviolet energy from the sun hitting the upper atmosphere and ionizing neutral particles, meaning that you're knocking electrons off of neutral molecules and atoms and those electrons are now just free floating and they have a negative charge. And then you also have positive ions left over. And they mix, they, they work together. Um, during the day, you have a stronger ionosphere because it's constantly being driven by the sun and you often have more layers during the day. At night, you have less layers. Uh, things, the electrons, they'll recombine. Uh, you don't have the external drivers as much, but it doesn't totally go away. This is a simple day-night relationship of the ionosphere. Um, we're gonna skip that in terms of time. Where do ham radio operators get their data right now? Uh, we have some very nice observation networks right now that you can use. This includes the reverse beacon network, which is monitoring Morse code, WhisperNet, which is monitoring uh, the weak signal propagation uh, network. We have PSK Reporter, which is monitoring FT8 and um, 
PSK31 and other digital modes. And so these networks are great. They're quasi global, they're uh, organic and community run, and they provide a good picture of what's going on uh, in ham radio data. And, and so you can actually take this, take observations from these systems. So this is, these are observations from uh, the, uh, from PSK reporter, or I'm sorry, from, um, yeah, from WhisperNet. These are observations from WhisperNet and the reverse speaking network showing the effect of a solar flare. When you have a solar flare, that can cause a radio blackout. It can cause the ionization to go so high in the D layer that it absorbs the signal. So this is before the solar flare. You have lots of signals, lots of communications. This is after the solar flare. And we can see that in the data. And if you lay it out right, you can measure how long it takes the system to recover and you can see multiple disturbances. Uh, we can see traveling ionospheric disturbances. We'll be hearing more about that later today in Diego's talk. And here you have these wave-like structures that move through the atmosphere. So here you can see this is 14 megahertz band. This is how far away you can, you can communicate with respect to time using uh, WhisperNet and RBN observations. And you can see these wave-like structures move through here. So you can see all of this in the ham radio data we have right now. These are examples of Doppler shift observations uh, taken during the eclipse. So here you're listening to WWV near 10 megahertz. And you can see that as uh, daylight comes uh, and the ionosphere becomes more dense, you get these positive Doppler shifts. As night comes, the ionosphere recedes. You can get these negative Doppler shifts as the path length increases. And here, this is taken during the eclipse. You can see the effect of the eclipse on here as well. So you get all these different effects. So this is all great, but the ham radio receiver networks we have, they weren't designed for science. So we could create a network. What if we could create a network of personal space weather stations that were designed for both science and ham radio from the ground up? And so that's the idea behind the Hamside Personal Space Weather Station project. So uh, the idea was first told to me by Ward Silver. He said, well, you have all these personal terrestrial weather stations that are multi-instrument inter -connect, internet connected and easy to set up and a reasonable cost. Can we do something like this for space weather? And that's where this idea came from. We want something that can be useful to ham radio operators, useful to space science and space weather communities, have a modular instrument design, um, small footprint, nice user interface, and a standard format to send data back to the central repository. And so that's what we have over here. This is a block diagram for what we think, what we're planning the personal space weather station to be. At its core, there will be some sort of software-defined radio, uh, which we'll hear which that is what Tapper is primarily designing, the Tangerine SDR. And this software-defined radio should be capable of monitoring all the things we just saw with RBN and PSK Reporter and WhisperNet. It should also be able to characterize HF noise, uh, have, be able to possibly detect lightning, detect traveling atmospheric disturbances. It should be very stable using a GPS disciplined oscillator. I will have a single board computer to do the processing, send it back to the internet. So that's the, that's the basic idea. We actually are going to have both a low cost and a uh, performance-based uh, personal space weather station. Case Western Reserve, we'll hear from later, they're developing low cost station. Um, Tapper is developing the Tangerine SDR uh, performance-based station. Uh, we have a number of teams. These are the different teams we'll be hearing from today. I am Nathaniel Purcell at the University of Scranton. I'm happy to announce that we have just uh, hired a postdoc, Dr. Dev Joshi, who will be working with us on working on the radio science. He'll be starting in May. Uh, University of Alabama, they are designing the software and the database. Uh, Tapper and uh, Zephyr Engineering, they are designing the performance-based uh, software defined radio, the Tangerine SDR, and they're also doing the ground magnetometer design. Case Western Reserve University is doing the low cost system. New Jersey Institute of Technology is supervising the magnetometer science, and the MIT Haystack Observatory is uh, providing additional uh, scientific analysis and advising on the project. So we have all of these people involved here. Uh, we are well on our way in terms of progress. We already have mock ups. There are some boards 
um, already in place, you can get the specification documents at tangerinesdr.com, and we will hear from each of these team members that will give the, their own updates. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Do the panelists have any questions? Okay, no, any questions or comments from the attendees? Well, th there's more than one that has come in. Alex Christ here just asked, are there cost targets defined for the low cost and performance based stations? Uh, yes, roughly we'd like the low cost to be sub $100 and the performance space to be around $500. Can I ask my question, Phil? Sure. Um, okay, uh, Nathaniel, this is Liz McDonald. So Hello. I was wondering how um, large those databases are already, if they're gigabytes or if you have any number on just, I'm just curious, um, the total amount of data that's already built up or the rate per year, that sort of thing. Sure, uh, Bill Engelke, are you there? Can you answer that question? Uh, as far as spots that have been collected from WhisperNet, Reverse Beacon, Net, Meek Beacon Network, uh, PSK Reporter, and the DX Cluster, it's uh, uh, just somewhat less than five terabytes at the moment. Um, we are interested, in, we're hoping we can figure out a way to put that into the Madrigal system. Um, still, we still need to do some work to figure out how to do that, but the idea is to make it that publicly accessible, organize it so it, we, it, it doesn't work very, very well as a hierarchical database, it's too big, it takes too long to search, so we're going to take a big data approach and just store the files in a publicly accessible format, basically allow people to download at will and do things like sequential search. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.